Reverend Lawson, it's good to see you. Thank you, Kim Brill. I'm glad to see you. It is, uh, I will tell you from personal point of privilege before I even start, whenever I see you, when I'm, whenever I'm in your presence, I feel calmer. And I, I oh attribute my. that to who you are. Um, and I thank you for your support of me throughout the years. I watch you regularly on Sunday morning. I Don't tell Melanie. <laughs> I think she knows. I think <laughs> knows. she knows. Um, this is, we talked earlier, a busy time with all the things that it are is. going on. And now as we come up on the 50th anniversary of the death of Dr. Martin Luther King, it takes on a special significance. And you knew him. You had a chance to interact with him. Um, where were you? when you found out that Dr. King had been shot? I have a little white church that Wheeler was born in. It's that church right there. And it was just a little two-story house. And I was on the second floor of that little two-story house with, with my children. And all of us were in that upstairs place. And we were devastated. When you do you remember what your first reaction was other than the, the disbelief that it might have happened? Did you have a chance to process? Do you remember what you processed at that time at the news that he had been killed? Well, aside from tremendous grief, and, and I, I, was, uh, I was just devastated when I learned they died, but I wasn't surprised. All of us had known that he was probably going to be assassinated. Uh, we didn't know when or how, but, but we were certain that it was going to happen. And why was that? Just because of the stances he took, the prominence that he had gained in the civil rights movement? Well, partly, and then also, most of his work was in the South, uh, which was at that point ex extremely anti-civil rights. Uh, and he had predicted it repeatedly himself. Uh, as you recall, in, in the last speech that he made in Memphis, mm -hmm. he said, I may not get there with you, but I will, uh, but, 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 but you will reach the promised land. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that whole, as a result of that happening, obviously the whole country, a lot of people don't remember what was going on there, but two months and one day later, Robert Kennedy was assassinated as well, which is a turbulent time for us. Um, when that happened with you, what kind of impact had Dr. King made upon your life in terms of how you uh, ministered to people and how you were taking on any level of activism? What kind of impact had he had on you up to that point in your life? Well, Dr. King and I were contemporaries. He was born six months after I was born, and so we came up during the same time. But I think that most of all, uh, I thought of him uh, as a person who was who was superior to me. He was uh, he w he was a charismatic figure, and he was a person uh, that I would call Dr. King rather than Martin. So I thought of him as a person who was changing history. Uh, I think that most of us who knew him mm -hmm. uh, knew him as a down home fellow, but. But we knew him also as, as a person who was making a, a great impact on our lives. Did your interaction with him influence the way that you ministered? Um, you, hear you came to Houston in 1955 as a, uh, at what was Texas Southern University at that point. And I'm, I'm guessing you came just with the idea of being a pastor or ministering to people, not necessarily being an activist. That's right. Uh, but I was, uh, I was a chaplain at Texas Southern University, so I was in the midst of a student community, uh, and so I was right there where, uh, where the heart of civil rights was, uh, the freedom rides and the sit-ins and the protest marches were all uh, among young people, just as the high school children are, are, are the voice of, of justice now. Mm -hmm. So the students were the voice of justice then. And our church was right there between uh, Texas Southern University and the University of Houston. So we were enmeshed in a student population. And I think that for that reason, uh, 
my own ministry uh, took a social works turn. And when you were in seminary, was that ever taught about ministering, not only saving souls, but going in a different direction and be civil rights advocates, those who were on the forefront were typically ministers. There were a lot of churches involved in all of that. And that kind of would seem to have been an evolution of sorts, was it not? It was, but it had not, it, it, it had not reached the clergy community at that time. And so you ask if, if it was taught in seminary. No, it was not. Uh, seminary uh, taught theology and, and it taught homiletics. It taught all, all, sorts, all sorts of religious stuff, but, but it didn't teach social action. From Dr. King's focus and the way he led and the way he helped to change things, how did you adapt what you were doing as a result of interacting with him or was there anything that he had done that you said, I, I, I think I want to try that? How were you impacted by his style? No, interestingly enough, that turn came largely because of the woman I married. I married Audrey Lawson, who was a social worker. And when we were, uh, when we were among the people establishing our church, Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church, uh, I thought of that church as basically a, a place where we would preach the gospel. And Audrey was a person who said, you're in a neighborhood that is in great need and you can't just preach the gospel. Uh, our people were bourgeois people uh, and Audrey said, just because they are bourgeois people, you have to teach them that they have the responsibility to reach out to this neighborhood. So she was largely responsible for the social action of Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church and my involvement in social action. I know at one point I saw uh, an archive that had a letter that you had typed that you sent to Dr. King asking him to come to the Houston area and it seemed like that um, you were imploring him to come because his presence would help elevate the focus of what this community needed. Do you remember that? By that time, I'd, I'd certainly known that, that we needed some kind of leadership uh, of that sort. And he needed to raise funds for SCLC. And so my feeling was that we could help him and he could, he could help us. Do you remember his visit here? Oh yes, very much. What was much. that like? Well, I was at that time head of the SCLC here in Houston. And he came to Houston, bringing with him a certain number of celebrities, uh, Aretha Franklin, I remember, and uh, Harry Belafonte, I remember, and his own staff were, were, were celebrities of a sort, Jesse Jackson and Andrew Young. And they all came to Houston to raise money. And at that time, uh, he was pretty well persona non grata uh, because of his, his civil rights activities and because the, the black preachers had been told, don't let this man uh, in your pulpit. He's a communist. And they had learned that from J. Edgar Hoover with, with the FBI. That, that's a little bit outside our, com our, our conversation. But when he came to Houston, uh, Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church, which was a little church at that time, was, w w was willing to accept him uh, into our church mm -hmm. and, and a few young pastors, but virtually all, all, all the older pastors turned him down. So, so I, I, I very well remember his visit uh, to Houston. I set up a, a, a conference for him mm -hmm. with, with all of these celebrities and we met in the old Houston Coliseum and somebody, and I'm going to guess it was probably the Klan, smoke bombed the concert and people rushed out of the, out of the, out of the Coliseum. Uh, this, was, this, this was a major event in, in my life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and at least I could remember what, what the, what the uh, turning down of Dr. King would mean. Uh, it, 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 it was a very real time in, in my life. Uh, I, I was not in Birmingham, I was not in Selma, so I had not seen the violence. But, but this made Dr. King's uh, 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 turning down very meaningful to me. 
how many other times in your life did you have a chance to actually meet him? Probably not, probably not, not more than half a dozen. Mm -hmm. uh, his work was east, east of the Mississippi, and we were west of the Mississippi, and so we had uh, distant contact with him, but for the most part, uh, our contact with him was through the media and through uh, mail, things of that sort. Uh, since, since I was asked to be uh, president of, of the NAACP Houston, uh, I'm sorry, of, of the SCLC Houston, uh, I, was, I was at least close enough to know pretty much what was going on east of the Mississippi. Because you were contemporaries and because of the interaction that you had with him, you knew his style, you both had the same sort of goals in mind in terms of uplifting the uh, African-American community and doing something positive for civil rights. How do you think that he would, uh, Dr. King, how do you think he would look at the progress that we have made today and how much further might think we'd have to go. I think it's probably maybe as part of your thought as well as what he might have thought. He would have thought good but not enough, which is what we feel right now. Mm -hmm. We are very proud that we have desegregation of buses and that uh, people can go into grocery stores uh, in, anytime they want to and in, into department stores and, 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 and that we would have elected a black president twice but I think we would have felt that it still is not enough uh, because the real victims were not just blacks. They were people who were, who were economically down. They were the poor. And that is who the victims are now. And I think that, uh, that having gotten some advantages for those who were poor, for those who were black, for women, for Hispanics, uh, for now uh, immigrants, we, 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 we would probably have felt that, that, that we have made some progress, but that we had not made enough. You've been on the front lines of those kinds of fights pretty much all your life. Um, how do you think that you are perceived? I, I, let me just tell you how you perceive as someone who is a leader, someone who speaks softly but carries a big stick in terms of making impacts. Um, with that in mind, um, how do you believe you will be perceived for what your impact has been in this community? I don't know. I simply hope that I, that I will have been faithful to what the, to, to, to what the gospel is. And the gospel uh, speaks of feeding the poor and clothing the naked. And if I have been faithful to that, I'll be, I'll be glad to be perceived that way. In your career here, after Dr. King's passing, as you picked up the mantle for this area, um, what stands out for those things that were some of the most difficult and some of those things that you can look back and you say, I'm very proud of that? Probably desegregating Houston in one day. Uh, probably uh, being able to, to open up the schools. Uh, probably working now toward the building of, of, of a geriatric hospital because the, the elderly are also uh, um, among the most important victims. If I can be perceived as one who has worked to help those things, I'll be glad. You talked about that desegregation in one day. I know that story, but you, you talk about how we didn't have the issues that a lot of other places had. Every, every time we see a video of Dr. King and his involvement in the South in the desegregation battle, we see water hoses and dogs against people, but we never saw that in Houston. And you say that that's because you were able to find some areas where those people who had a vested interest in us being a better community, you found some common ground for people to kind of understand. But one day is what it took. And that is, that is, the, key, that, that is the key phrase, uh, common ground. What happened was that we uh, called together 
uh, the business and, and the clergy uh, communities uh, in, in, into the Old Rice Hotel. And we said to them that uh, Birmingham and, and, and Jackson and, and all those places have had uh, violence. And it's been largely because everybody knew w what was happening with Martin and with the NAACP. Uh, and right now, the media, which has been our friend, and which she has fairly well manipulated so that, so, 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 so that the nation could know what he was doing, uh, have been our friend and in some sense our enemy. So Houston has been able to uh, to do things like building the first dome stadium uh, by uh, having the first space center and by doing a number of things like that. And that has helped us to grow uh, in business. But if we could desegregate without the media broadcasting that uh, and 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 with the nation simply learning that Houston had, had desegregated, then you wouldn't have too much difficulty attracting business to Houston. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, uh, Houston has had a, a great deal of, of success in getting new businesses to come here because Houston had not had the violence of, of, of Birmingham and, and Charlotte. And so I think that uh, it was the coming together of people. Uh, that phrase, common ground, uh, had a great deal to do. So right now, uh, three old people, uh, Archbishop Fiorenza and Rabbi Karp and Bill Lawson coming together. We are called uh, the Three Amigos. And I think that it means something that when we go uh, asking for something, uh, at least the door is not closed against mm -hmm. us. Mm -hmm. And I think that that all had, had something to do with that desegregating in one day. And the television stations were complicit with you, were they not? I mean, they agreed not to broadcast. I, mean, I don't know, it was, I know that Channel 2 and Channel 13 were involved in saying, we're not going to do any coverage of this because you had convinced them that they shouldn't. And, and, and the newspapers, at, at, time, at that time we had uh, two newspapers. Uh, and the concept was that we would simply take down the white and colored buses in the, si in the, in the buses and, 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 and that we would simply open the doors mm -hmm. to, to stores like Foley's and Battlestein's without telling anybody. Uh, people would come to the stores and greeters at, at, at the doors would just welcome them in. They could try on shoes, they could buy groceries anywhere they wanted to. And uh, time and life were fairly well angry with us because we had not told them that, that this was going to happen. Uh, but I think, that, I think that, that the most important thing was that we came together uh, in, in the Rice Hotel, and that coalitions have been fairly well. What has, what has, what, what is, what, what has made the difference? Mm -hmm. And uh, we were, we were uh, in common, and 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 that notion being in common made the difference. What an evolution, and I'm going to almost finish here. Um, through the years, there's always been someone who's kind of risen to the top that kind of gets the national attention as being a, quote, leader of the, quote, movement that you said there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, is there anybody out there now that is a single person? Or are you convinced that a uh, combination of a lot of individual leaders is going to make the difference going forward. There is not in Houston uh, a, a single person. There are, there are a number of groups, uh, and the NAACP and ADL uh, and, and groups like that have, have, 
have made a major difference. And I think that, uh, that, that, that in the nation, that there's not going to be a Moses type. I think that, that in the nation, uh, there are going to be things like Channel 2 uh, who, have, who, who have brought on board uh, black people like you uh, and Hispanic people. And, and there's a woman cameraman with you, camera person with you. And I think that, and I think that this is what is going to happen, that, that, that people will simply agree that the Trump model of you're fired uh, is not going to be uh, the model for the nation. That people getting together and saying, uh, that is wrong. And what is right is, is inclusion. Uh, and I think that without having a Martin Luther King Jr., uh, there are going to be people who simply will accept values and principle and will, and, and will do what they think needs to be done. You call it the Trump model. I, I get the sense that you're not exactly enamored with the way the administration is right now headed in the direction and the direction of the country under this leadership? Not at all. And the solution to that is just going to be what do you think? And the solution is, is going to be rejection of, 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 of that model mm. uh, and, and, and acceptance uh, of the model that simply says you have to include people Diversity is more important than, than having the kind of cabinet I want. I don't want to leave you without asking you about faith and the role that's played in your life and the role that's played in our community as we approach this most uh, wonderful time of the year for Christians as we approach Resurrection Sunday and this is going to air on Resurrection Sunday. Um, what's your fervent hope? for the way this community, locally and nationally, can embrace faith to move forward and do those things that are important. I hope that we can hear the voice of Moses, who is, uh, who is a good part of Passover, and that's going on right now. This is being taped on Thursday, but uh, on Friday, we, 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 we we will be commemorating the death of Jesus. Uh, and I think that, that it is very important for us to realize that, that, that the principles Moses gave to us and the principles Jesus gave to us are the chief principles that God has given to us. And my calling uh, as a minister uh, is, 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 is to teach the principles of Moses and Jesus. And you never stop, do you? Never stop. Thank you, Reverend Lawson. Appreciate your time. You're welcome, and thank you for giving me this audience.